Alright. So, uh, going live. Uh, we don't have any viewers right now, but. Yeah. So, today we're gonna, for people who are gonna watch this as a video, uh, we're gonna be painting some of the scenery for the Ice Age diorama today. And a few of us who work here are gonna bounce in and out of this live stream a little bit. So, it's gonna be uh, me, I'm Carl, we're gonna have Michael, we might have Spencer on it a bit later. Uh, Ridley might come up and paint some stuff. Onyx, one of our volunteers, might come up and do stuff. Just choose a little. Uh... And yeah, I had to glue that one. But overall, today we're going to be painting the scenery, going over how we paint the scenery, uh, using visual references for some of the plants and some of the smaller animals I'm going to be painting today. And just generally, again, talk about the methods that go into the new exhibit as it gets closer and closer to that exhibit uh, being done. And probably over the next few. <clears throat> weeks on Sundays we'll do live streams about preparing it. Did my print finish? Uh, yes, it's in the office. Yeah, let's go. So, uh, the first thing is for the plants, for the uh, the pine needles and the leaves on the broadleaf trees, what we're going to do is probably a base in green, and this one actually still needs to be I can do that. So did you try hollowing this out as a... Uh, it was printed hollow. And that's one thing we are working with. We don't have, I don't have great 3D modeling experience. I am a lot better at printing and model uh, painting. So we are somewhat limited sometimes in the techniques we can use to make certain things. So we're limited to files that we can find pre-existing. We're hoping that that is a obstacle we can sort of overcome. I used CAD like many years ago, but like nowhere to the extent of like anything actual looking. And natural looking is really tough to imitate, so the people who make uh, stuff like these fir trees, and we're going to get that down to an area where we can actually see it, these fir trees, um, and some of the animals that we use in the diorama, it's an amazing talent that they're able to convincingly make something that looks natural. Again, that is just a very... Very tough thing to do to convincingly make something look organic and irregular, uh, especially because as humans we tend to be really good at making regular and patterned objects and things. Uh, we're also we're, we're very good pattern recognizers, so if you use a, a standard sort of template, it's very quick that someone's going to pick that out. Um, so if you, <clears throat> that's what people think Uncanny Valley was kind of evolutionary for, was all the uh, other human-related species. Yeah, that's one of the ones. And then also another thing for pattern recognition. Uh, pattern recognition is just a useful trait as well. Right. And humans are not notable for seeing patterns where none exists. Um, it's something that we are so good at it, our brains will kind of notice randomness and make an ordered sort of category out of it. And is it pareidolia or is it pareidolia? Uh, for what? So oh, it's, for it's that seeing, phenomenon? It's, yeah, it's like seeing patterns and like faces where they don't actually do. I can't remember, but that is a thing. That's why you'll hear oftentimes people talk about that face on the moon that doesn't actually exist. But people saw a pattern of certain craters and uh, at certain times, it, with certain lighting and the angle of the moon where it was at in its rotation, it would look, it would look like a face. In Japan, it's a rabbit. Really? Yeah. That is very odd, but... That's so why you see a lot of, like, in, like, anime and stuff, like... You see rabbits a lot of times are associated with the moon. That's interesting. And that's one thing, is a lot of times animals, so... We're just talking about that. Uh, since this live is a bit more freeform, we are going to be talking about a range of subjects. Um, and also, uh, we got one viewer, so whoever just tuned in, we are starting... We're painting scenery for the new diorama that's going to be here in a couple weeks. Uh, and also feel free to put questions in the chat. Um, we'll do our best to answer them. We might have to go to do a little bit of research, but... Uh, that's the fun part. <laughs> yeah, that is actually kind of the fun part. Uh, but yeah, so today we're just painting the uh, mostly the non-animal scenery. Uh, so it's plants, rocks, that sort of thing. And... What we're mostly doing right now is base coating and getting the first layers of paint on these things. So we're starting the trees, the for especially for these fir trees, 
with a kind of primary green and we're going to work our way initially down to a darker green and then we're going to move to a technique called dry brushing later uh, using yellows and browns to bring it to a more natural coloration. Um, see what else we got? Because we talked about a lot of the stuff last week about the general thing with getting the grass the right color. Uh, so a big thing for this diorama that we are, are trying, uh, since it is the Ice Age in Spring, is its context, like I've said before, we don't often see these animals in. A lot of Ice Age animals, very often in media, get portrayed as living in kind of a, one, a cartoonish and sort of a seemingly endless winter. Where the Ice Age was still a heavily seasonal time, where spring and summer could actually be quite hot in some parts of the world. And uh, again, there are a lot of plants. And the plants were a big part of that ecosystem. The Ice Age is a really big time for grasslands. Grass handles that type of uh, yearly um, weather shifting very well. Given that most of the grass is underground, um, the bulk of the plant is protected from those weather conditions and it can store nutrients quite well. And that just the upper bit that we all associate with grass, the, the grass blades can basically die off and grow back with the stored nutrients come spring. It's an incredibly resilient plant. And as we've talked about in other live streams, in the span of geologic time and time on Earth, a relatively new plant. Uh, grasses, true grasses, only evolved roughly about 45 million years ago and did not become incredibly widespread until only about 5 million years ago. Grasses mostly were uh, tuft growing plants along the ground. They didn't cover it fully in a lot of places. Um, and five million years ago, with climate shifts and everything, grass became a very, very efficient plant at taking advantage of yearly uh, semi-regular weather shifts. Uh, it's a remarkably um, successful plant, a remarkably complex plant for how simple it looks. Uh, another plant, kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum for groups of plants, uh, pine trees are one of the oldest groups of plants. And they have handled... Yep, they've handled climates and times ranging from the Paleozoic all the way up until modern day. Uh, pine needles are remarkably durable, uh, sort of, uh, what's it called on plants? Uh, foliage, I guess? Yeah. Um, they yeah, handle yeah. adverse weather conditions quite well. They don't lose a lot of water. Uh, while they may not have a lot of surface area for gaining CO2, they, those plants make up for it by being able to have more pine needles in, on smaller area. Um, and then also, they're really tough. Uh, you'll notice not a lot of animals eat uh, pine needles. Uh, and that's because leaves are far, far less coarse and rough on your teeth. And probably a little bit tastier. That's the other thing. is Plants, uh, we tend to think of as quite passive living things. But they're actually quite active and often shape ecosystems uh, in extreme ways. Uh, and they also react uh, a little bit to animal life. Uh, a big thing why a lot of plants and leaves often taste bitter is as a defense mechanism against herbivores. They don't, they don't, they don't want to be eaten. Um, same way that an animal wouldn't want to be eaten by a predator, plants don't want to be eaten by an herbivore. And they do a lot of things to try to avoid that. Uh, you see a lot of natural defense mechanisms in plants other than just tasting bad. Uh, Michael, you, can you think of any of those ones? Because there's some pretty fun ones. The what? Sorry. Plant defense mechanisms. How they kind of keep animals from eating. Um, roses of thorns, which are modified leaf stems. Yeah. yeah. That one. Thorns are a really efficient one. If you've ever seen an acacia plant, acacia plants are uh, native to a few places, but prominently in Africa, they have thorns that are like over two inches in length, sometimes over three inches, as a defense mechanism against a lot of the herbivores, they are like rhinoceros, elephants, and giraffes. Mm -hmm. uh, these large herbivores that will eat a lot of plant, plant matter at once, and you don't, don't want to be that plant that gets most of its leaves 
Some of my some of the things I find super impressive are the ones there are certain plants that have berries that are only poisonous to like terrestrial animals and then most birds can ignore ignore the the poison oh yeah yeah the bird could plants love birds because they can spread the, the the seeds extremely far and pollen as well in the feathers yeah so so there's a lot there's a lot of plants where you'll see you'll see birds happily munching down but mammals they're definitely not for you <laughs> Uh, another really good defense mechanism is chemical uh, defenses. Uh, there's a really famous plant in Australia that is quite dangerous, uh, and it is called a very kind of goofy name that isn't um, isn't overtly dangerous sounding. It's the gimpy gimpy plant. Is that the, like is that the one that causes like the allegedly like yes most pain? It is a plant that the chemical uh, interacting with nerve nerves in your uh, body. Causes one of the most excruciating pains known. Uh, it is something that uh, there's records of horses walking through bits of gimpy gimpy plant patches, and then running, and basically the horses try to die. That yeah. <laughs> it's a plant that causes some of the most excruciating pain, and people who get uh, affected by it, uh, it lingers for a long time. I think it lingers for over a year, from what I've heard. Uh, it's a serious medical thing, and it. It makes it really hard to sleep, uh, makes it very, very hard to do just about anything else other than try to make that pain stop, uh, which is a very effective defense mechanism because if you see an animal, let's say you're a kangaroo, and you see an animal interact with the gimpy, gimpy plant and get in this horrible pain, you're going to remember that. And much like uh, poison animals, uh, where they rely kind of on that, well, watch someone eat a poison dart frog once, you're never going to eat a poison dart frog. The animal that ate the poison dart frog, unfortunately, doesn't get to learn the lesson of don't eat the poison dart frog, because they wind up dying. But it's a very effective way to get a whole population to go, got it, we leave that alone. It can lead a lot into a discussion about coloration, too. Yeah, so some plants don't use coloration as much as a defense as animals do, though. Yeah, plants use coloration as more of an enticement. Which, which is interesting. That's a big part of flowers. Another uh, group of plants that's not as old as you would think. They evolved, like, I think, during the Cretaceous, uh, the first flowering plants. Uh, likely as a response to the evolution of uh, insects like bees and butterflies. Which are other animals we tend to take for granted. Uh, pollinators are massively important. Uh, given a lot of the issues facing a lot of pollinators today, not just in North America, but in other places, that's a huge issue, especially for farm. And, uh, lot, you know, um, I'd say more large-scale agriculture that really does rely on them. Uh, because we don't currently have a really efficient way to mimic uh, large-scale pollination. Uh, it's something that I've seen some uh techniques kind of floated around for how to do it they all seem quite honestly a little bit sci-fi and a little bit out of the uh the realm of possibility for the time being uh one proposed idea was um literally make tiny little robot bees yeah <laughs> uh seems somewhat cartoonish Bee Jones. um led to a lot of very fun jokes on the internet about it which is like that's how you get the robot bee apocalypse uh, but in reality, the amount of upkeep that would need um, is simply, I think, resource-wise impractical. And this is a big thing when you're managing stuff like that. Um, nature has systems that have uh, sort of evolved in place uh, that are quite efficient. While they can be quite sensitive to change, it's typically best to kind of let them do what they do. Uh, it's a good thing to not try to change it. Or try to work around it. The best management often works around nature. Uh, wildlife management, a big thing is getting, essentially, the system to kind of regulate itself at a certain point. Uh, yeah, you can you can yeah, nudge, but okay. you can nudge, but it, it's resource heavy right. and most of the time impractical. Mm -hmm. To kind of get, yeah, to kind of like take the whole process over. Yeah, generally, it is best to again. Figure out a way to get the system to do itself. Have animals using natural behaviors to achieve the goals that you want. Uh, no brush. <laughs>
Uh, if you want to get a plate in front of the kitchen so you have some of the... Uh, but yeah, no, so today, um, again, uh, just a new person pop up in the, uh, in the chat. Feel free to ask questions. Um, the big thing here is we are here to answer some of those questions. Um, uh, so Michael, this is one thing. You and I have been in uh, Human Dimensions of Wildlife this semester. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that is kind of turning out to be one of the more useful classes I think we're taking. <laughs> it's useful. Uh -huh. It's very different than all the other ones. Yeah, it's it's very human focused, but it's which, been said most of our job most of our jobs are probably going to be human focused, which, which isn't a surprise. Yeah, which makes sense. A big a big thing. Um, one second. The big thing about those jobs is you're trying to make it so people understand how these things work. I'll put it on. One second. I'll be right back. So yeah, we human dimensions, and our professor said that makes up ninety percent or more of our job. Which, when you hear the the term wildlife management, you think that most of our job is going to be actually dealing with the wildlife. But the public is the one that deals with the wildlife probably more than we do. At least in terms of up here with hunting, hunting, fishing, things like that. Yeah, we have plates now. Yep. We can start helping. Thank you. Plate country. But yeah, no, the big thing with it is just oftentimes education is a big part of it. Um, that was the only thing we went over just this last week Beetle. or two. <laughs> Zonix? Yeah. Um, uh, and education is a big part of what we do here. Um, the big thing is the more people understand something, um, the going into some sort of an issue, um, the less, in the wildlife management case, the manager has to explain to them. Uh, they can start off with a little bit more specific terms and stuff, and add complexity to what they're, they're dealing with so that people, uh, the public, has a better base of knowledge. So one of the big things at the Science Center here is we like to make sure that uh, we hope people leave with a better understanding of things than they come in with. And that's also becoming a big thing in the scientific field as the internet be has become more prevalent and people are getting better and better about research uh, when they're on the internet, is that it's becoming a lot less about what you know and how well you're able to communicate and help other people interpret that knowledge and comprehend it. Uh, helping people uh, understand concepts and stuff is a huge part of just general science nowadays because, um, well, honestly, Let's say you're a researcher, you have a very specific field, um, and you publish your work. Uh, your work is on the internet for anyone to read through. And the big thing is, most people's research is on the internet for everyone to read through. Uh, given an afternoon and nothing else going on, theoretically, someone could read through a lot of research papers. But the big thing is, they may not have the education background uh, to fully comprehend some of the stuff, or to understand the specific uh, intricacies in a field. And that's a big part of what scientists are here for, is to help people understand it. That's a lot of what my um, molecular biology was, um, was actually learning how to re read and understand scientific papers, because they are written a little bit differently. They're, they're, they're written for, they're written for like undergraduate level, so most people aren't going to realize what most of it says, and that's not... It's not really anyone's fault. Like I, I, I. It's a very I can, specific niche of yeah, writing. I can read biology papers mostly just fine, but if you if you throw a, a chemistry or physics paper at me, I don't. I'm not gonna know any any better than Joe Schmo off the street. Yeah, don't throw a chemistry paper at me. That is probably one of my worst uh, subjects I actually have ever done. Um, chemistry is full of stuff that is just remarkably intricate, but also very complex. So you're, either, you, you're, either, you're either good at chemistry or you just Or you find it. someone who is. Yeah. 
I wanted to learn chemistry in sixth grade. <laughs> you uh, can probably a, imagine how that went. Yeah, that's a rough age to start with that. Um, yeah. You can do like essentials. Yeah. It's like straight up like high school, even high school level chemistry. Maybe I could start learning chemistry, but I, I, I actually am more interested in biology. That's something that's very common with all of us here at the Science Centers. We tend to be a lot more biology focused. Uh, which is one of the reasons why we're, we are often looking for people with uh, different backgrounds and stuff like that because uh, we can get a little bit too far in on the biology aspect and we forget, you know, stuff like geology, chemistry, mm -hmm. physics, which are all very important and very interesting. I think Brian and James both have chemistry, bachelors in chemistry. That's good. Yeah. I think Ryan, I'm, I'm pretty Ryan? sure Ryan does. I know James does. Yeah. And it's important. I, I forget exactly what. Maybe I could do geology because I like rocks. Geology is also a very good one. It's a very broad science, but it Geology's also cool. covers a lot of very important stuff from geologic time, how we know how old things are, um, and then also just types of rocks, uh, geologic phenomenon, like... Uh, volcanoes, tectonic plates, oh, yeah. and those are the things that drive a lot of the climate shifts that stuff in biology responds to. Um, you know, those are what will shift the climate when continents are in different places. Those will change ocean currents, uh, which can change weather patterns, and those cause cascade effects. It's Geology is a very crucial science. It's why it's a huge component uh, when people study paleontology. Um, I think BSU used to have a course of uh, paleontology for quite a while. Um, my friend's my friend's dad has. I think he's got a PhD in uh, paleontology. Paleontology is. He's, he's extremely intelligent. <laughs> yeah, paleontology is a really interesting science, and that's kind of the focus of the big of the diorama. Um, uh, it is. Ice Age North America, that's a huge paleontological one. And it's probably one of the better known and better understood time periods, uh, simply because it was so recent, and these animals left behind quite a lot of material. It's very easy to study them, uh, which is one of the reasons I started with that, because we are going to have signage with some fun little not, you know, facts and stuff about these animals. Um, which would not help with that. Well, because that might be a good test to see how... We got a format of signage going. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I think I think Ellie's gonna be a uh, co-worker on our uh, animal signage when whenever Ryan gets like a, a yes or no on that. Yeah. It's probably smart to have two people. Right? At, le at least two people. Yeah, it's always good. Uh, this is why having two people on the signage is good because something a sentence that makes sense to to me might not make sense to someone else. And it's always good, especially if one person has a different specialty than the other. What are we going to paint the rocks? I'll, actually, I'll show you, because we're going to start with the rocks. Oh, just a second. Yeah. Um, I'm not a huge fan of these trees. The fir trees? Yeah, they're kind of a pain in the butt. To... They're very complex shape, but they look really nice. They're a, they're a paint in the butt. Yeah. So with the rocks, what was using that? the dry brush method. Oh, for I would actually say for this one, uh, go just really get in there. We'll do the dry brush in a little bit, but that's a good method to. So the rocks we're going to start with a base of gray. Grace, and that is going to be a good foundation to start from, especially on these rocks where we're going to want to be able to get some tones in them. Because the big thing with the rocks is we don't want these to become too complex. Uh, simply because we don't want them to detract attention away from the animals in the diorama. We want to make sure that the focus is on the animals and, to a degree, the plants, which are the big uh, focus points of this exhibit. And that's something we often think about when we're designing an exhibit uh, with this level of complexity, is that we have to make sure that everything is working towards what we want the exhibit to accomplish. You don't want something overshadowing the main goal of the exhibit. Um, because then that kind of inhibits the exhibit from being a, educational in the way that we would, we would like it. Do we have a gray, or are we just going to make it black and white? Just mix black and white, kind of, kind of to the tone that you think works. 
So the big thing is, we could paint these rocks a lot, in a lot more complex ways, but um, we're going to stick to a, a roughly simpler one because they are not the main focus of this diorama. So I grab a new brush. Uh, just wash it out in the cup of water you got. But yeah, so the big... The big thing is, we may have dioramas in the future where the rocks are the focus, actually. Uh, one of the things I'm, that we've been discussing was a uh, lunar surface, which might become a separate exhibit in, in and of itself. I just don't know... It'd be fun, but I don't know like how crazy we can get it, because you know, it's pretty monotone. Yeah, but we have other stuff. We have uh, astronauts and stuff you can have on it. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, I guess you could do the... Yeah, there's a lot of sites and stuff. Yeah, and that can be more dedicated to astronomy. Um, which in and of itself is a very interesting science. We have um, that little tiny little planet diorama we got downstairs. The orrery? The orrery, yeah. Or which, or we should, or which we've been, I think we have talked about at some point of getting that back up and running. I would love that. That thing is so cool. I've also talked about getting a model of the solar system up and up and going at one point, which would be fun. I think I told you last week the the really interesting thing from um in Australia. What was that? There was a too loud if I turn on the window. No, no, go for it. There was a um there's a planetarium I believe in Australia and it has like a scale model of the solar system. And the sun is the size of yeah. um, a basketball. But um so it's, like it's a, either it's either Neptune or Pluto. That planet is in I think Oslo, Sweden. Oh right, so it's like a real two scale. That's like yeah. a multiple continent spanning. Yeah, it's exhibit. It's properly scaled, which is awesome. Um, oftentimes, with, uh, scaling exhibits like what we're doing here, we're I believe working in one twenty eighth scale, roughly for the diorama. Um, <laughs> You do want to make consistent scale, um, but when it comes to stuff like that large, like the solar system, it can be really, really hard to get a fully consistent scale that's workable. Uh, just for that reason, a basketball is not that big, but on the scale of the solar system, the planets are quite small and quite far away, so getting those distances accurate um, leads to... Uh, where was the sun again? It was in Australia? Yeah, so one, one of them in Australia. And then it leads to, um, again, you have one of the other planets way up in, in, in Scandinavia. <laughs> yeah. Which is yeah, quite you're, a bit of a hike. When you really get to it, there's... So one astronomical unit is 93 million miles, which is the average distance from the sun to the Earth. And it's like... Mars is like one and a half astronomical units away from the sun, and then Jupiter moves all the way out to like, I don't know, like 20 astronomical units. The scale, the scale once you get to the, the, uh, the gas planets, the Jovian planets, I think they're called, it's quite it, it gets insane. It gets absolutely crazy with how, how far away things are. And how large they are. The amount of, um... Like, size categories bigger than the Earth that Jupiter is. Just casually, yeah, like... It's quite extreme. Casually bigger. So what I'm starting to work on now are some of our smaller animals. Uh, these are uh, Smilodon. So this is the state fossil of California. I did a little bit of work on these last night at home. But I wanted to work on them a little bit in here. So we have done a live stream on these animals before. Uh, the saber-toothed cats are they're an interesting group of animals. Uh, they are they are true cats, but they're a little bit different than the cats we have today, and they often uh, get represented in media uh, with spots or stripes of some sort. And one of the reasons like they get represented like that is because oftentimes they are compared to stuff like tigers and leopards. And we tend to associate those animals with uh, stripes and spots. But in reality, a lot of the things about, that dictate, especially large cats, uh, color of their coat actually come down to the habitat they live in and uh, a lot of it uh, down to the relative size in that habitat. 
So I looked it up, and one of the things, uh, it's the reason why lions aren't a super exciting color is they're quite large out in open areas. Uh, whereas leopards are a little bit smaller and tend to stick to wooded areas, so they tend to be more spotted, because cats that live in denser uh, vegetation habitats do tend to be uh, more likely to be spotted or striped. Freaks are silhouette. Yep, which is really useful in a jungle where you might not be able to start your chase from further away. So I'm going to handle it. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, so you can see what we're starting with is a relatively lion-like coat pattern. And that's because these animals tended to hunt in large grasslands. So they didn't need that big camouflage. What they needed was a relatively easy-to-miss color pattern so they could get up closer and sneak in. That uh, spots aren't great in a grassland. Uh, neither are stripes, really. No, because no, it draws too much attention. I mean, when you're in the... When you're in the forest, there's so much, there's so much differing colors and textures that you kind of want to, you want to not imitate it, but you you want to break up monotony. Yeah, you want to hop in on that sort of broad range of stuff. Yeah. Um, actually, you know, if you do want to, so what I did is mix these two colors for the primer thing, and we just don't paint the main. Okay. So we're gonna leave the main darker. So, and I, try and paint the face? Yeah, you will, we'll, do, we'll get to the face. You can start with the body. If you're not feeling comfortable painting the body, I can burn the face, I can handle that. You said even amount? Uh, a little bit more of the lighter one, but I'd say that should be good for now. See what that gets you. Uh, the other thing that Smilodon is, it's a really unique species in that we have a lot of individual specimens of it, thanks to places like the Librea Tar Pits. Uh, which has led to us having a really good understanding of that species as a whole because of all the individual variation that we understand fit within that one species. Which is great. Um, but also I have to do the yep, and we can just wait on that so we don't have that paint dry. Start to wait. Um, so this is a little lighter. Yeah, that should be good. This individual variation color. So one of the big things about cats as well is we do know that Smilodon were social, but... Oh, wait, did you paint this one? Oh, uh, look. Should I, should I oh. paint it? Okay. The ones over there haven't had any touch-up. Okay. I just don't know what exactly we want to... I don't want to ruin your vision. Okay, no worries, no worries. Um, the big thing with Smilodon is you know they were social, but... Um, we also know there was minimal sexual dimorphism, meaning that there was likely not a large, either a large mane on the males alone, or that the females may have had a small, they may have both had a small mane as well. So what I'm putting on the smile on for the diorama are small manes uh, that both males and females have. It kind of breaks up the monotonous color scheme that could get kind of boring. And it's something that is very likely they may have had a small mane. Uh, these are animals, they are predators, but they also, being social animals, would have gotten into uh, little fights. And a mane around your neck uh, really might help protect you from uh, serious injury. Can I try these? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna try the trunks and those, they should be. So, are you happy with the. That green, so we're gonna go over that with um, dry brushing in a little bit. Yeah, if you want to dry brush over with yellows as well. I was watching some of the hair, thicker hair especially, being really abrasive is really good for you. Yeah, uh, in, in modern uh, day lions, uh, the male lions use those manes to protect themselves from pretty serious injury during fights. Yeah, that was good. Chunky, chunky paint for some reason, like, just gets the, the reflex. The gag reflex one. Yeah, another thing about Smilodon is um, they're pretty famous. I think pretty much everyone knows what a saber tooth cat is. Uh, worldwide, there are multiple different species of them. And in the live stream that I did on these, uh, well over uh, three months ago at this point, um, one of the big things we covered is there are about 15 different species of saber tooth cats. Some of them were bigger, some of them were smaller, 
Uh, some of them lived in different places. Um, Smilodon actually wasn't the most widely distributed one. It was the biggest, though. And probably had the biggest sabers on its, you know, its jaws. But... Do the, sorry, do we do the snout or not? Uh, the snout will cover with a different one. I'll show you what we can do with that. Let's we'll see. That's kind of how we go. Uh, but the big thing with saber tooth cats is they were uh, kind of a predatory response to uh, really large herbivores, which evolved uh, during the last ice age. Mega. Yeah, where you had these really massive herbivores taking advantage of the large grasslands. And. Yep. Uh, also, feel free to hop in on if you want to do any stuff for this or hop on live stream for a bit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, like the big thing with all the megafauna was that they were taking advantage of those large grasslands where they could eat large quantities of food all at once. And um, they were able to grow to quite large sizes, and actually the large size helped them digest a lot of uh, this food. Uh, having a long digestive tract for a herbivore is very useful. And um, when they got to those massive sizes, Normal cats that we think of today, like lions, tigers, and leopards, well, they aren't going to be able to take out those large animals. They're excessively large and quite difficult to bring down. And those saber teeth actually wind up being a really useful uh, tool biologically for getting through those massive layers of fat and muscle and getting to the soft bits of the animal so you can bring it down as a predator. And uh, taking them down as a group also is a great evolutionary response to that. Uh, being social, is, it makes it easier for a group of you to take down, let's say, a mammoth. Uh, it's easier when there's about, you know, let's say maybe seven or eight of you rather than just one of you going after it. Uh, but when those prey animals went extinct at the end of the last ice age, unfortunately there wasn't enough large prey to support the saber-toothed cats, which were generally quite large animals required a lot of food on the landscape and when that wasn't there they were unable to really cope and the more modern cats who were able to hunt smaller prey more efficiently were kind of able to take over and are still in a lot of ecosystems the dominant uh, carnivorous animals they're remarkably well adapted for that I'm gonna let stuff dry for now uh, you know, start going up tree trunks, maybe, like on the uh, trees that we've already painted. And just starting with some browns. I'm going to leave these paints for the other ones, though. And remember to cap these ones. Oh, yeah. In between uses. I'm going to really quick check the floor, just make sure everything's going well. So we do have a birthday up here today, so it might get a little bit noisy, but we also have some kids who might be answering questions kids have about this. Uh. I just realized I was doing it under the table the whole time. <laughs> so you weren't being able to do it. I do it. Yeah, I
So a big thing when you're painting uh, is you want to make sure you wash your brushes. Uh, you don't want paint to harden on the brush. It makes it so the paint brushes don't absorb paint as well. Then the size of the paintbrush you use is also quite important. For smaller details, you don't want to be going in with a massive brush. Uh, that can be a bit counterproductive. Sun. Sun. <laughs> we should have a proper two scale sun for this diorama. Ooh, I don't know where we're going to stick that. Uh, 128 scale is it's still big. It's still a very large sun. I think that's still bigger than Earth by quite a bit. By many. It's still basically a star. Again, when you get into the uh, solar system and the, uh, the scale of, of objects and celestial stuff, it... I don't know if it would be massive enough to become a star at that point. It might, it might be a brown dwarf at that point. I mean, those are technically still stars, are they not? Um, I think, I think they're they're like failed stars. I, I don't know if I don't know if they're I don't know if they're considered the star. Yeah, because I think I don't I think it was maybe proven false, but some people are thinking that Jupiter may have been a failed star because it wasn't quite massive enough. Interesting. So just someone that didn't quite pull in enough stuff. Yeah, it didn't have enough. It, di it didn't have enough mass to uh, to, to form fusion. Interesting. As again, that's an area of science I'm not super knowledgeable about myself. It's always fun to learn stuff. Because Ju Jupiter does, um, I think it produces more heat than it takes in. I mean, I think we do too, but like it's to to a very large amount. Because we get a lot of our, our heat from the geothermal, so from Earth's core, right? Uh, radiation, too. Yeah. Um, a lot it's of the radioactive point. materials um, breaking down causes as well. But yeah, the, the core just from having mass. Because the Earth's core is quite dense as well. Oh, yeah, being nickel, iron nickel, yeah. I was a, I was an astronomy nerd for a lot of my life. Ah, uh, never got super into that, but I definitely got into the, as you can tell, the paleontology side of things. Because I've been able to find a way to get my whole job revolving around animals <laughs> and prehistoric animals. Perfect. Um, I think, I think there was a single kid who didn't at one point go through an Egyptology thing, well. That was a thing that, like, everyone I remember growing up got super into Egypt for a while. At some point. Which, that's another diorama we've been talking about, is, uh, Upper Egypt. Yeah. Getting the pyramids and the, and the, and the sphinx up in there. That's something that often science museums don't touch that much, which is archaeology. Yeah, the Science Center in Minnesota has... they have a mummy. Ooh, that's cool. So there's actually kind of a fun story for why there aren't that many mummies around today. And it is not the reason you would think. It's not the ravages of time slowly decaying the mummies. It actually goes to um, uh, Victorian England. Um, Mummies uh, were used as fun decorations and things to ingest. Or they would grind them up into a powder and ingest them, is one of the ways I've heard. I think they also turned them into paint as well. Yeah, yeah, mummy paint is also another thing, which 
I guess people wanted to paint uh, their walls with dead person a lot. Uh, but yeah, they used up a lot of mummies, uh, which would have been great archaeological finds uh, when you really think of it. But, uh, yeah, it wasn't a huge priority at the time. And also, um, you know, we're, uh, would have been uh, the rightful uh, property of the nation of Egypt, um, things that are culturally significant to them. Uh, that is a big trend in archaeology right now, is seeing if we can get archaeological artifacts that are culturally significant to people around the world from museums in places like London and Washington, D.C., and return them to the peoples they rightfully belong to. And a big push right now, especially with 3D printing and modeling and scanning, is we can replicate these objects, these artifacts, pretty perfectly uh, with 3D scanning and then basically uh, make copies we can have in our museums. And that's a huge part of model making uh, right now and that it is a useful so uh, skill to have if we're going to go into science because we'll be able to help them replace uh, bits of their exhibits which over time are going to be slowly being phased out into more uh, replicas than, uh, than there are actual objects. So hopefully we can get, again, get these objects to the people they belong to. Because uh, the big thing about respecting uh, peoples around the world is that their culture is not simply something for us to ogle at a museum. Yeah, it's um, one of those morally, morally great things that Museums kind of are, but it's like, I mean, it's interesting, it's educational, but... But the ethics of how you have your collection, how right. you come by it, are a big deal. Right. And that is, in a lot of places, there's serious contention. Some museums get uh, lawsuits quite frequently filed against them for stuff they have out of an exhibit. Uh, a lot of paleontological, so dinosaur fossils especially, uh, technically get found on tribal land uh, and under uh, fair ruling of law do belong to the tribes who live in those regions. Uh, but in the past, in less fair times, uh, they have simply, those uh, artifacts simply were taken and those tribes were not financially compensated for them. Uh, which is thankfully a trend that is now somewhat uh, sort of shifting. But it's still not great. Uh, and a lot of times, indigenous people do tend to lose out in these things due to uh, failings. Again. Um, and then it's just something uh, where just modern day just interactions with people are quite important. Uh, and human dimensions is quite important. This is another area where it comes in in different fields other than just wildlife. You have to consider the people you're interacting with. You have to make sure that you're not treat mistreating them. about now we've had a couple of people tune in no questions really yet people are still at church or whatever it is somewhere Minnesota's weird for that least. there was a thing that kind of weirded me out when I moved here is how, how many things are uh, closed on Sundays well Bemidji is extra like it's yeah. it's weird even to me and I live in the city Live in the so. rural too, and rural areas in most states is where stuff gets a little bit more um, closed on Sunday. Right. So that's a big thing. Oftentimes we have people calling and asking, "Is the science center open on Sundays?" And yes, we are. Um, so again, anyone who wants to come in today, if you're watching this live stream and you think, "Oh, that'd be nice to go into the science center," we are open today, as you can hear. Uh, our audio is quite um, <laughs> busy. Yes. We got kids going upstairs, we got people running around, we got people interacting with the animals downstairs. Very nice day. Sundays are often very, very fun here. Uh, just because we're not open quite as long, but 
we got nice crowds of people. It's a nice place to go after, you know, breakfast and stuff. And it's a day that people almost always have off. At least in some capacity. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, uh, on us. Uh, <laughs> us. We're, we're the exception to that. Almost everyone has it off. That is the concession of our, of our players. professions and jobs. Because we're going to be working slightly weirder hours. I haven't had weekends off. Oh, I haven't had weekends off since New Year's. I haven't had weekends off in years. <laughs> Just years in general. I mean, I, I did retail for... Oh yeah, that'll do. Forever. It. So. Uh, I would say some browns. So we have some browns over here. We have some fruit fries and maybe mix in even a little bit of orange. Maybe even mix in a bit of orange into your paint for the trunks. But do a base coat in brown. Mm -hmm. I think one year it's Sunday. That's kind of nice. If I haven't had an actual day off of class. Oh yeah. I'd, I've had, um, I have had work or school every day of the week since roughly New Year's. Yep, so I feel you. Yeah. It's... They can't even see me. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I, I, when I went to Sentry, it was... I'd work... I'd work Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, Sunday, and then I'd go to school every day. So, like... I was always on the same stretch of highway for every day for like a year. <laughs> you gotta like really shake it. I, I had a problem with it. I would not shake it with the. <laughs> yeah, don't shake the cap with the cap open. And that's probably enough. You don't wanna. Paint goes pretty far. If anyone has any questions at home about what we're doing, feel free to ask. That's the big thing. We want this to be something where people can actually interact with us while we're doing this process. Uh, it's, it's a good way to get people more involved and more interested in it. So. I should figure out a way for the Science Center to fund getting Legos so I can build a pyramid out of Lego. Oh my. Yeah, that'd be fun, man. It's a lot of the same color, but there are techniques that you can do that kind of make it so it's not just a massive straight pyramid. Like, you know, there's a lot of new pieces. And, and with a lot of archaeological stuff, if, you, if you're not going to build an Egyptian pyramid, you can build a Mesoamerican pyramid, and they were covered in color. Um, honestly... Doing a archaeology diorama thing, like a rotating one of that might be a good idea. Because um, you have stuff like the city of Teotihuacan, you have Angkor Wat, you could have, you know, Giza, uh, Rome. Um, Rome would be a fun character. There's a lot of really cool, well, maybe a specific section of Rome, you know? We'll get the Science Center to buy the Lego Coliseum. Okay, that, that was like 9,000 pieces. <laughs> really? Was that many pieces? It was the biggest Lego set for about a year until um, there, was a, there was a new one. It was the world map. But it was made out of one-by-ones. Oh. So it, it's not nearly as massive, but it's still 11,000 pieces. Yeah. But the Colosseum is kind of generally considered as like the biggest Lego set of all time. Yeah. Also, Michael, you might want to talk to Lee about uh, doing the archaeology exhibit. That might be a fun project. So you're a little bit more into that. Yeah, I mean, I'd probably want to build a, a plan. Yeah. I'd, I'd, pr I'd probably want to do that after after I do all the signage. We redid the signage. For yeah, because that is I really want to. Get it all unified. Yeah, I really want to fix it all. And some people, some some animals don't have it anymore. Yeah. I don't even. I've been quite. I haven't quite gotten everybody's name down. So it's like, what's yeah. your name? And I'm like, ah, I'm sorry, I don't know. Yeah, definitely. That's what and that's a big thing at museums. The signage is quite important. Uh, that is a big way to get. Uh, information to the public. They don't always want to ask us questions. You know, sometimes you just want to be able to walk around and read and relax at a museum. 
And that is a big thing, is we want to make sure that we can facilitate that. Uh, so this is a thing you'll notice, uh, there's differences in how people work with painting, by the way. You notice I tend to use my hand as a palette, so <laughs> to thin out or dry out paint. Uh, some people don't like to do that, uh, other people uh, love that. I like to do that. <laughs> yeah, Onyx, you, you work the same way, though. <laughs> Um, but I also use the. Uh, yeah, I use that less because uh, I normally work with smaller quantities. Uh, but you'll notice with the rocks, what I'm doing is dry brushing a little bit of white, and that's just getting on those high points, which gives a nice bit of detailing to it. And you typically want to do this type of stuff with a lighter coloration than what you started with. So you work up from darker colors to lighter colors when you're painting stuff. Like this. Yeah, I like using. Um, Rub and buff for like metallic. Getting the a, details out. It's a very good one for metallic. It's actually a really good idea. I need to start using that more. Yeah, I guess it'd probably be pretty good for D and D. Yeah, for miniatures, for recreation and stuff, it'd be great. Good for like shields, swords too. Sword. I used to I used to paint like nerf guns a little bit. Oh, those are always fun. We need to find a way, uh, something relevant for Nerf guns besides so a bunch of Nerf guns. <laughs> uh, flight pathing, aerodynamics. Yeah, that's why we need physicists. Because uh, uh, Nerf guns are a rather involved, a little bit of a toy for how how simple we think they are. There's a lot that goes into making those things efficient and fun. Yeah. Fun efficient, maximum fun for as little the material as you can get. We joke, but uh, it's quite intense. Um, another big thing with, uh, so we've 3D printed a lot of this stuff. A uh, big thing with 3D printing, uh, there's a huge market for 3D printing uh, custom Nerf guns. Oh, yeah. And that's a big thing uh, I wanted to talk that's about. A good yeah, with 3D printing is it allows us to to do actually some quite impressive things. The rocks are fun. I, I honestly enjoy painting rocks quite a bit. They're a very fun kind of object to paint. Um, but yeah, 3D printing as that... It's just a stump. So as 3D printing becomes a more common and available thing, people come up with new uses all the time, and it's always interesting to see what people use 3D printing for. Oh. Work on that. This is a little bit funny. But yeah, big thing with it is it makes a lot of people a lot easier. Uh, people have been using 3D printing to make stuff like prosthetics. Uh, not just for humans, but also for animals. Uh, there's more than a few birds with prosthetic 3D printed beaks. Uh, I've seen an eagle with it. Uh, there's a tortoise I've seen with a 3D printed uh, section of shell. Um, 3D printing is becoming more and more available, more and more easily accessible, and that is going to open up to more and more people with newer ideas. And honestly, the more people we can get working on something, the more ideas we get going, the better it tends to be. The more progress we can make in technology. And that's one of the good things about it is everyone will have different ideas. Everyone will come at it from a slightly different angle. One of the coolest things I've seen that's not terribly related, but um, for like filmmaking, they've started using VR. With uh, with modeling CG sets. Yeah, I've seen that too, which is very interesting. It allows them to save a little bit because you don't have to fly everybody everywhere. Did they do that for the man Phil Warren? That's one of the first thing? big projects they yeah. actually did that on. Because I know, because they they had the the was it the video wall thing? I forget what they called it. Yeah. Which is that the man Warren was the first use of it. Then I think they also used the the VR sets to kind of build everything up and make sure it looks good. I'm going to set stuff on that. Too. Oh, how about it? Keeps off the table. Uh, big thing, you want to make sure you keep everything clean. Uh, paint can be a little bit of a mess to clean up sometimes. That's cool. That one's so <laughs> I mean, I guess it's... Oh, it's a little... 
Okay, as you can see, we have a lot of trees, and these are going to be things that kids can place in the diorama. Um, and hopefully that'll make it uh, more fun for kids to be able to build their own little little area, a little habitat in the Ice Age. Now for now, we're going to let stuff dry. I think your detail work is very nice. And very much like it. They're very cool. simple to paint. It, the good thing about dry brushing and the rocks in particular, they look really good. They make it look like you're really good at painting. Um, and it's always very fun because people get really impressed suddenly. <laughs> uh, and I'm like, oh, I just, you know, just wheel the brush over it a little bit. We're gonna. How do we drip? I don't. I've never. So what you do is you get some paint on your brush, you wipe most of it off, and then you just gently go oh. over the high points of the object you're painting. It's really good on objects like these plants that have a lot of sculpted detail. Right. Because you're just getting those high points, it gives a lot of depth and really brings out textures. Yeah, I so guess that's kind of the same what I did with the ribbon buff. Is I would like put it down and then I take a rag and you'll get I'd, a like, lot of very, I'd, like very, I'd like. You know, I'd kind of get it on the rag, but then I'd, I'd wipe a lot of it off. Yeah, it's very good. Uh, I did a lot of dry brushing on painting some of the animals for this diorama, which we'll look at um, possibly later today or even um, uh, next week. Uh, so we're going to focus on a lot more on a lot of the animals, actually. Does my brush actually need to be dry to dry brush? Yes, you want to dry it. But otherwise, you'd be doing a different technique called wet plant which is also quite useful for getting color transitions. So one of the things you will notice, just anyone who tuned in last week, uh, is that it sounds a lot louder in here, and that's because we are coming up probably on our more popular season for just daily guests. Uh, spring and summer is going to get a lot of people coming in. You'd think in Minnesota, given how cold it gets outside, that people would come in here uh, more in the winter, but they got other stuff going on. Minnesota has quite a bit of recreational winter activity. Uh, but in the summer, it gets kind of hot out, and this is a nice air-conditioned building uh, for people to come to. So basically, the water is still cold. Oh, that's a lot of yellow. It's not that cold, Oh, I did do a lot of yellow, didn't I? Yeah. Honestly, yeah. I think the trees, too. Yeah. Yeah. We'll make it work. Yeah. But today is just generally just us working, kind of plugging away at this. Uh, the big thing with this is uh, we have a deadline coming up for this. So hopefully. Uh, Within the next two weeks, we'll actually have the table for the diorama, and with that's when we have to start getting a lot more stuff finished. Um, because we have to get ready to be on exhibit on the floor, uh, hopefully, uh, by the end of April, which is this month. Uh, also, uh, this month on the 22nd, on Earth Day, which is nice. Nice holiday to celebrate. On Earth Day, we have a prehistoric painting night for people to come in. It's going to be run by a Bemidji State University capstone student. Uh, and that is much like our, our prehistoric painting night in March. It is 20 spots available, so we'll have 20 individual animals painted. Uh, we do have a sign up sheet at the front desk, uh, along with phone number and email uh, you can call. And but by the end of the live stream, I will bring bring that up and hold that up for the camera. Uh, but we do recommend you RSVP for that. Uh, we do accept walk-ins if we have open spots. But if all the sign-in spots have been filled out, uh, we can't accept walk-ins. And we have had uh, incidents where people uh, come in and go, Hey, we're ready to paint! And um, all the spots were taken. So if you really want, if you really want the animal, uh, you really want to paint the animal, you do want to sign up ahead of time. Mm -hmm.
The only thing you notice with the uh, the trees and the leaves and stuff, we're going over the green with yellow. Uh, they are very good complementary colors, especially when you're trying to imitate uh, natural plant uh, sort of leaf coloration or pine needle coloration. It also, again, gives good depth, and the colors don't contrast that much, so it's not like we're going over it with, like, red. And again, lends to a just slightly more authentic looking plant, which I don't think that shows up too well on camera, unfortunately. Uh, so some of the stuff you are going to have to come in and see in person. come in we are still open until five on Sundays and Sundays are again a nice relaxed day typically to come in. Uh, typically on Sundays we've done the uh, snake feeding the night before uh, we've done a lot of other animals sort of stuff the night before so all the animals are a lot mellower um, and we're hoping to be able to carry through uh, fun little live streams and demonstrations like this, hopefully, for people to actually come in. Uh, just nice little things for people to come in. I don't know how to feel about that stuff. Oh, we can always go back over it. It's fine. Again, the uh, plants aren't the big draw of the diorama. They are just there for scenery. The big focus of the diorama is on the ideas. But it's always good about the plants, which are really important. So I do the same thing that I did with this. Oh, you can even go with yellow for the track. So you see what I'm doing there? One of the things I mentioned last week is we're going to have this as a rotating exhibit where we're going to have multiple different dioramas. Um, and one of the ones that uh, we've, I've been toying around with is a very different type of ecosystem, which is the Mesozoic, or the time of the dinosaurs, ocean. And that's one where I've got to figure out how to uh, we'll make a visually interesting diorama when the, the habitat is aquatic. There's no trees I can put in there. There's no... You can do kelp? You can do kelp. Eh, I have to look up if kelp was around. I just have a radically different time period in Earth's history. That's fair. And that's going to be a big one of finding all of the animals for that, and... There still has to be a decent amount of aquatic plants. Yeah. You'd imagine. Yeah, but it's going to be a big challenge to get that one to, um, to be a fun diorama for people to interact with. But it's one that I would like to do because the Mesozoic Oceans are really interesting. Uh, I've been starting to go over a lot of the marine reptiles in live streams. Uh, yesterday I covered plesiosaurs and pliosaurs. Uh, anyone who tuned into that saw that I actually, instead of doing a drawing on the board, I actually had the models. And um, I'm going to be continuing that, but it's tr tough picking a good time when there's a good diversity of them. Uh, the Mesozoic fossil record is definitely a lot more limited. Maybe. You want to paint stuff? No. That was just one of, another one of our volunteers. I have no idea who's a volunteer anymore and who works. I might go over with another layer of deciduous uh, trees. I can do it. Once I'm done with this guy. I'm gonna see how the floor is doing. They might need a few more people out there. It's gonna be really busy. Oh, shoot! What happened? I did a little too much. That's easy enough to fix. Uh, gonna make a Bob Ross joke, which is happy little accidents. 
Oh, that doesn't look awful. Man. It's just heavy with pollen. Yep. I'm so glad I am not a I'm cursing myself now, but I'm so glad I don't have seasonal allergies. Yeah, those would be rough. Some people just like, oh man, it's it's the door, it's they look like you die. <laughs> Some people, it's, I got a few friends here, it's just killer with them. I'm glad I don't even really have allergies. Yeah, I'm pretty grateful in that department as well. My dad has a few. And they're not, it's not terrible because they're not like common, like peanuts. But that's a bad allergy to have. Yeah, I'd be sad. I love peanut butter. Yeah, no, it's always rough when someone is allergic to a food that's quite common and popular. Peanut butter is a bop. That's... So you can actually hear in the background, uh, Lene, one of our bird uh, keepers, is here uh, doing some feeding work with our raptors. So you can hear our Merlin in the background screeching. It's an old lady. Very excited for feeding. I think Ryan was talking that Mer the Merlin, she's like ancient. Yeah, that like she's very old. Like she's well beyond the Merlin life expectancy. And that's just because living, yeah, living in captivity really gives you a great edge on their wild counterparts. <laughs> Quick wash my hands. So we're probably going to call the uh, actual live stream itself for now, uh, but uh, we'll be doing another one of these next Sunday when we're painting the animals, and that's going to be a pretty fun one. We're going to be able to talk about those animals to, to a degree, and it's going to be a little bit more in-depth than with the trees. So thank you for everyone who tuned in, and again, feel free to come into the Science Center. I'm going to really quick pull up one of the posters for Prehistoric Painting Night. The uh, email address and the phone number you can call. Uh, this is one of our older posters, but the information is all still good on it. And I'm going to put this in the chat before we go. Thank you for tuning in.